Next Generation for you started off with such promise and such high hopes and the little think tank that you were in on the ground floor and oh then it turned God. very we sour. We had so much fun until Gene Roddenberry's lawyer showed up. And what was happening is I was, Bob Justman and I, and I loved Bob. I admired him so much. I, I mean, and we didn't always see eye to eye, but um, there was a lot of respect even when we disagreed. And um, uh, we were having a lot of fun and then, and the studio was reading all the memos. And so they would go to Gene and say, David's doing such a great job, make sure you, you know, keep him happy and, and give him more authority to do this because we, we really have a treasure there. And once the lawyer was there, every time the studio would say, the studio execs were very, they would say, David's doing a great job. The, the lawyer would hear, they're going to take the show away from us and give it to David, which is stupid, because all I wanted to do was make the best show possible so Gene could in, finally enjoy being the, the hero of Star Trek, which had been taken away from him on the original show. And, um, and so I would go in, and they'd ball me out. The lawyer would, and, and, and would tell Gene, you can't let David have too much authority or too much power. And the lawyer started hiring other people and putting them in as major producers. And I kept getting moved down and down. I was supposed to be a producer. He kept moving me down and down and down the food chain until I wasn't even a story editor, just a consultant. So, well, pardon my English, but fuck that. That was not what I was promised. And Gene had promised in public that we would do a story with gay characters because the fans had asked for it. He would announced it in a meeting and Rick Berman had written a memo saying, here's a three-page memo, here's all the issue stories we could do. And he had one about AIDS. Now, because Heinlein had been very big on blood donorship and I had promised Robert that I would, because Robert Heinlein was a friend of mine, I said, I'm going to do a story about blood donorship. And I had a story where we ran out of artificial blood and we had to, you know, have crew of the Enterprise donate blood and the goal was to put a card at the end, you can donate blood too. We had a critical blood shortage because people were even afraid to donate blood, be donate blood because of the AIDS crisis. So I had this, this uh, really good script, I think, really good dilemma called Blood and Fire. And it was supposed to be the third or fourth episode. And I was uh, working on the teleplay, I realized, oh, these two characters might be in a relationship. And there's four lines of dialogue where Riker says to one of the characters, so how long have you two been together? And the other says, since the Academy. That was it, right? If you were like under 12, oh, they're good friends. You know, and, it, and but this would, it would keep Gene's promise with it, and well, Rick Berman and a few other people hit the ceiling. And so, oh, we can't put gay characters in this show because even after all the promises and, and, yeah. and the meetings and the, and the memos, we can't have gay characters because mommies will write letters. And I wrote a memo that said, if not here, where? If not, Gene made a promise, if not here, where? If not now, when? And also, Star Trek should be the leader on these issues, not the follower. And uh, uh, Herb Wright, who was the producer I was working for, said, stuck his head in my office and said, great memo. You still gotta change the script. <laughs> and so we went through like three or four rewrites and it never got any better. And finally, Bob Justman wrote a memo that said, are, what are we, a bunch of pussies? <laughs> um, let's go back to the first draft. That was a good draft. And my contract was supposed to either get renewed or expire in June. And, uh, you know, and uh, I was getting sick from the emotional stress because I realized there is a level of hypocrisy in this office I can no longer deal with. And, because you know, my one of my heroes, one of my mentors was Harlan Ellison, and you just, and it, it's like the story is king. And uh, by the way, Harlan was a character reference for me when I adopted my little boy. So, um, and he was like my big brother, and and uh, uh, I knew sides of him that most people never saw, and he was a hero. Um, so I, I, you know, I was asking myself, what would Harlan do? And I said, well, after he, he would have kicked down all the walls of all the buildings on the lot. So I just went to Gene and I said, just don't renew my contract. I have another deal pending, which I did. Um, I had been offered another deal, which would put money in my pocket. What I knew it wasn't going to go very far, but at least I had, it gave me an out. And um, so uh, uh, I left 
And then I found out that some of the people in the offices were saying I'd been fired. So my agent said, I'm having trouble getting you into offices. He said, what did you do? I walked in with a stack of memos and scripts, and, and he says, okay, it, I'm, I'm taking this to the Writers Guild, and the Writers Guild went and filed a, a grievance on my behalf and Dorothy Fontana's behalf that we had been doing producer-level work, but we're not being given the wages or the credits. And uh, so this made me Gene's enemy for life. Uh, the funny thing is, is uh, in 1990, I sent Gene a note saying, I still remember all the good times we had. I, I blame Gene's lawyer, not Gene. And you can I, say Leonard Mazeless now. No, I don't even want that. The, okay. Even the words make the, my <laughs> gorge boil like a cork released in 30 fathoms. It's blah. <laughs> then even the name is disgusting. It's a, so, I, uh, can I just, I don't want to stop you, but has everybody seen Chaos on the Bridge? Bill did a yeah. documentary. This, all this finally came out. No, no, that is the tip of the iceberg. Well, I, yes. far away. I didn't mean to say, but I mean, that was that tip had been like never heard of, yeah. never seen. Until so, uh, but I sent Gene a note saying, look, I remember all the good times and that's what I'm going to remember. Because I knew he was dying. I knew we were going to lose him soon. And Gene totally misunderstood. He thought I was trying to get you back on the show. I said, I don't want to go back on Star Trek. I don't, you know, I'm not crazy about the direction that it went. I want to do the stories we were doing in the original series. And nobody's doing that, at least not till the Orville. Um, so, uh, I, I, you know, and the Gene misunderstood that. So, but it was okay. As far as I was concerned, you know, Gene was a hero to me for 20 years. And I'm not going to let that god awful lawyer spoil 20 years because we had a bad experience for a while in Next Gen. Um, well, he got his karmic comeuppance eventually. Well, they could not, when they were shooting chaos on the bridge, they could not find any pictures of him. Uh, yeah. He was not, he was a walking elbow wrinkle. He was just, you know, the, the Vogons and Hitchhikers, the, yeah, he scared them. <laughs>